Hi everyone! So good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. So today, our topic will be on sexual harassment in the workplace. Our speaker will discuss key points of the said issue and later on, uh, after discussion, you as viewers, if you want to ask questions to our speaker, uh, we highly encourage you to just type in your questions and after discussion, we'll read it to our speaker. Our speaker for today is one of UMAP's trusted lawyers. He's a partner of Pisumbing Torres Law Office, and he has over a decade of experience in labor litigation and legal advice on employment issues such as labor relations, compensation and benefits, transfers, and termination of employment. He earned his Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of the Philippines, where he placed seven in his class. So everyone, please welcome Attorney John Zuniga. Hi, Attorney John. Hi, Kate. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. What are you, John? Yes, uh, Kate, uh, may I start? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. So as mentioned, uh, uh, by the way, Kate, thank you for the kind introduction. So as mentioned by Kate, uh, I'll be discussing this afternoon uh, the anti-sexual harassment law, as well as uh, some Supreme Court decisions uh, which have uh, ruled on issues pertaining to sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, if we have more time, I can also discuss some Supreme Court decisions regarding uh, romance and illicit relations in the workplace. So maybe I can start with uh, what the law provides. So we're talking about the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995. So uh, as provided under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, uh, sexual harassment is committed in a work-related or employment environment by uh, an employer, an employee, manager, supervisor, or anyone who has uh, authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over another in a work environment. So normally this is committed by a manager, or supervisor or someone who is uh, has some authority over a subordinate. So the usual question is what happens if the sexual harassment or harassment is committed by someone uh, on the same level as the supposed victim of the harassment or if it is committed by a subordinate, uh, it will not be considered as a violation of the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995, but nevertheless, it may still be considered as some form of uh, misconduct or even a violation of company policies against harassment in the workplace. But of course, first of all, we'll, let's talk about what is provided for under the law. So as I've said, it is committed by someone who has authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over another. And the second element is that there should be a demand uh, or request for any sexual favor. So whether or not the demand, request, or requirement is accepted by the object of the said act. So it's not required that the uh, supposed victim of sexual harassment would resist the advances of the offender as long as there is a demand for sexual favor so whether or not uh, the victim subsequently accedes or agrees to the demand, then sexual harassment under the law may still be uh, committed. That is because there's a uh, presumption that the offender, uh, because of the authority, influence, or moral ascendancy uh, exercised by the offender over the victim, then uh, it's possible that the, the, the victim might uh, agree to the demand for sexual favor. So even if there is some form of uh, consent, then uh, the act may still be considered as a violation or maybe penalized under the law. 
So the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act also states that work-related uh, sexual harassment is com uh, committed in the following situations. So for instance, as a condition in the hiring of employment or continued employment, or in the grant of uh, favorable comp uh, compensation or terms and conditions of employment. For instance, if the sexual offender will promise a promotion or a salary increase or other uh, favorable terms and conditions of employment for the victim to agree to the demand for or request for sexual favor. And uh, another situation is when the refusal results in limiting or in any way discriminates or uh, diminishes employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affects the employee. So for instance, uh, because of the refusal of the employee to agree to the sexual uh, advances of the offender, the employee might be uh, subject to discrimination in terms of uh, promotion or grant of salary increase or other uh, favorable terms and conditions of employment then uh, this may still be considered as a violation of the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act. Then the last two elements under the law is that the situations in um, the item number one that I mentioned, when there is, a, in the case of hiring, grant of uh, terms and conditions of employment, or it results in discrimination, and it would impair the employee's rights or privileges under existing labor laws. For instance, if the employee will be subject to constructive dismissal uh, as a result of the, the harassment committed by the offender. And lastly, uh, the situations in item one uh, that I discussed earlier would result in an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the employee. Uh, then what are the duties of the employer under the law? Uh, there are basically two duties of the employer. So I understand that most of the attendees are HR managers or HR generalists. So you should be aware of the duties of the employer because it will be your uh, part of your functions to ensure that the employer is compliant with the requirements of the anti-sexual harassment law. Because under the law, the employer or head of office is uh, solidarily liable with the offender if, uh, for instance, if, if it fails to uh, perform its duties under uh, the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act. Uh, also, if it fails to act, for instance, on a complaint for sexual uh, involving a claim of sexual harassment. So the, uh, the two main duties of the employer is one, to promulgate rules and regulations to seek to minimize instances or prevent uh, the commission of sexual harassment in the workplace. And second, uh, to create a committee on decorum and investigation, which will be tasked to uh, investigate complaints uh, involving sexual harassment in the workplace, and then make uh, recommendations to management. So these recommendations may include the imposition of uh, disciplinary penalties, including possible termination of employment of the uh, offender. The law also provides that uh, the offended party may file a civil case for damages and also to uh, file a criminal complaint for violation of the anti-sexual harassment law. So the law provides that uh, in case of uh, conviction, for instance, uh, in a criminal complaint for sexual harassment, then the offender may be subjected to imprisonment from one month to six months or uh, a fine of uh, 10,000 to 20,000 pesos or both at the discretion of the court. Uh, under the law, the victim of sexual harassment has three years from uh, the commission of the offense to file a complaint for sexual harassment or a civil case or a criminal case involving a violation of the anti-sexual harassment law. So of course, when I'm talking about 
prescriptive period or the deadline for filing a complaint. I'm talking about just the civil cases or the criminal cases arising from violation of the law. But if we're talking about uh, possible violations of company policies that may lead to uh, disciplinary proceedings, then uh, the prescriptive period under the law, as I will discuss later on, uh, in the, some of the Supreme Court decisions uh, that ruled on, on the on, an employee's right to file a, an administrative complaint for sexual harassment, then the three-year prescriptive period will not apply. So, of course, it's not always about uh, filing of cases, of civil or criminal cases against the offender. In most instances, uh, we as people managers or HR uh, members of the HR department will be uh, concerned with uh, possible complications if a complaint uh, for sexual harassment in the workplace is made. Uh, we will probably be uh, asked whether we can uh, impose disciplinary actions as well as the ultimate penalty of dismissal in the event uh, that there is a complaint for sexual harassment, uh, what are our obligations as the employer, and whether the exercise of certain uh, management prerogatives arising from the commission of sexual harassment would be justified. So uh, I will be discussing some Supreme Court decisions which might serve as uh, guidelines in, in determining whether the actions of the employer uh, would be justified depending on the circumstances uh, surrounding the complaint for sexual harassment. But first of all, some uh, maybe some general principles. Uh, first of all, in the interpretation of the law and applicability of jurisprudence, uh, the Supreme Court may make rulings that are not really consistent with uh, previous rulings on the matter. Uh, uh, while you are aware that in, in the Philippines, we follow the so-called doctrine of stare uh, decisis, we're in a, a doctrine laid down by the Supreme Court should be considered as uh, part of the law of the land and will be a binding precedent for uh, subsequent decisions based on uh, similar facts. Sometimes in uh, the labor courts, in their effort to uh, perform their constitutional obligation to afford the so-called full protection to uh, labor or to rule in favor of the employee, they uh, might the, the rulings might be based or might be made on a case-to-case -case basis and not necessarily uh, based on uh, previous doctrines laid down in uh, previous decisions of the Supreme Court. But as a general rule, uh, of course, the employer has the prerogative to uh, control all aspects of the employment relationship. But these, the exercise of these prerogatives are not absolute. So the employer also has the burden of showing, for instance, if a labor complaint is filed, the employer has the burden of showing that it exercise its prerogatives in good faith and uh, in accordance with uh, law, contract, uh, fair play, and justice. As you might be aware, for instance, in, the, in instances wherein the employer will uh, dismiss an employee, for instance, because of a complaint for sexual harassment, the employer has the burden of proving the just causes for dismissal and uh, compliance with procedural due process requirements. So by just process, these are the grounds under the labor code, such as uh, serious misconduct, uh, willful disobedience of the lawful orders of the employer, uh, and so on. Attorney John, excuse me. Yes, uh, Kate? Uh, medyo nagagano lang po yung mic, sir. Okay. Is this better? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kate. So for uh, procedural due process requirements, the employer is uh, required to observe the so-called twin notice requirement. So this involves the, the issuance of a notice to explain 
uh, basically giving the employee an opportunity to respond to the charges or the allegations against him or her. So that the notice to explain should, should, should sufficiently describe the charge against the employee. And then the employee will be given uh, an opportunity to uh, respond to the allegations. So under uh, Supreme Court decisions, this should be at, for at least uh, five days from a receipt of the notice to explain. And in some instances, there might be a need to uh, hold an administrative hearing or conference to give the employee an additional opportunity to be heard. So based on Supreme Court decisions, an administrative hearing is required in at least uh, four instances. The, the first one is if it is if an, if a hearing is expressly uh, uh, requested by the employee. Second, if it is required under company policy. Third is uh, when there are substantial evidentiary disputes. For instance, uh, it's a case of he said, she said. Uh, the, the complainant is saying one thing, the respondent employee is saying another, and uh, their allegations are, are conflicting. In, in, in those instances, there might be a need for the employer to conduct an administrative hearing to try to find out or ascertain uh, who is uh, actually telling the truth. So uh, the fourth ground under Supreme Court decisions is uh, in similar or analogous circumstances wherein an administrative hearing should be held. Uh, another guideline is that, uh, as you may know, the, our Philippine Constitution states that uh, the state shall afford full protection to labor. Uh, the labor code also states that in case of doubt as to the evidence presented by the parties, then the doubt should be resolved in favor of the employees. So basically, we are in a pro-labor jurisdiction. Uh, for instance, if a complaint for illegal dismissal is filed, the employee just needs to allege that he or she has been the subject or has been subjected to illegal dismissal, and the employer already has the burden of uh, proving the validity of dismissal through substantial evidence. Uh, substantial evidence has been defined as such relevant evidence as a reasonable man might uh, consider as uh, sufficient to uh, justify a conclusion. So on a lighter note, uh, one last guideline, I think it, some, somebody said, I think it was Confucius who said that choose a job you love and you never have to work a day. Uh, maybe we can add that uh, based on uh, certain company policies or Supreme Court decisions governing a relationship in the workplace, choose to love a co-worker and it might just cost you your job or if this constitutes a violation of certain uh, company policies that are reasonable or, or, or are lawful. So let's proceed with uh, the Supreme Court decisions. The first decision, Supreme Court decision that I'll discuss is the case of Delphine Villarama versus NLRC and Golden Donuts, Inc. This decision was actually rendered even prior to the promulgation of the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act. But I included this in the presentation because this shows that the liabilities and rights uh, involving uh, the commission of sexual harassment do not necessarily arise from the anti-sexual harassment law. The employer, nevertheless, notwithstanding the provisions of the law, has the prerogative to exercise certain acts to address instances of sexual harassment. Or even without a law, uh, the commission of sexual harassment may be considered as a serious misconduct or a violation of company policies, even if, if it is not a violation of the provisions of the anti-sexual harassment law. So what are the facts of the Villarama case? So this involves a clerk typist. So let's call her Divina, who submitted a resignation letter alleging uh, sexual harassment. So according to her, uh, 
she was invited by her manager, uh, Delphine, and another manager, uh, Jess, to uh, to dinner with the other girls in her department. But uh, the last minute, she found out that it was uh, she was the only female uh, in the group. So they had dinner and drinks. Uh, she did not have second thoughts on accepting the invitation and having dinner with uh, her managers because she thought that this was just a, a an invitation to for them to bond. So uh, after they had dinner and drinks, the manager offered to uh, offered her uh, uh, Divina a ride and and to bring her home. But instead of uh, bringing her directly to her house. Uh, I think this is a, the classic case of the so-called uh, biglang liko, when uh, instead of bringing her to her house, the manager brought uh, Divina to a motel. So of course v Divina resisted and uh, pleaded with her manager to uh, bring her home instead, and thereafter uh, filed a complaint against her manager and then resigned from the company. Uh, when uh, the manager, uh, Delphine, was confronted by the company president, uh, he initially admitted that he committed some uh, form of wrongdoing and also agreed to resign. But subsequently, he had a change of mind and did not submit his resignation letter because on the ground that uh, the termination of his employment is uh, too harsh a penalty, uh, considering that according to him, he did not commit a serious offense. But nevertheless, uh, the company, Golden Donuts, proceeded to dismiss the manager. So the issue here is whether or not the company had uh, just cause to dismiss Delphine. Uh, so, as you may be aware of, in case of an illegal dismissal complaint, uh, the case will be resolved by a labor arbiter of the National Labor Relations Commission or the NLRC. And a decision of the NLRC may be appealed to the appellate uh, division of the NLRC, who will then uh, be composed of three uh, commissioners who will rule on the appeal. Uh, under uh, current jurisprudence, the decision of the NLRC may be elevated to the Court of Appeals and thereafter to the Supreme Court. But at the time the Villarama case was resolved, uh, decisions of the NLRC were uh, immediately elevated to the Supreme Court. So the labor arbiter ruled that Delphine was illegally dismissed because according to the arbiter, the penalty of dismissal was uh, not proportionate to the act committed by uh, the manager. But the decision of the arbiter was reversed by the appellate division of the NLRC. So the NLRC ruled that Delphine was validly dismissed, or there were grounds to dismiss Delphine, except that the company did not comply with the procedural due process requirements or did not comply with the so-called twin notice requirement when it merely asked Delphine to resign instead of uh, giving him giving him an opportunity to explain his side. So what was the ruling of the Supreme Court? So the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the company was justified in uh, terminating the employment relationship with its manager. Uh, in this regard, the, the Supreme Court noted the seriousness uh, or the gravity of the acts committed by uh, Delphine. Uh, according to the Supreme Court, sexual harassment abounds in all six, six societies, but it is uh, more reprehensible or more serious when inflicted by someone with moral ascendancy over the victims, such as uh, in the case of Delphine, he was supposed to uh, supervise or oversee or even mentor uh, his subordinate, Divina, but instead of doing so, he took advantage of his position 
in order to subject Divina to harassment. Uh, the Supreme Court also noted that, that there was substantial evidence that the uh, Delphine committed uh, the acts uh, mentioned by Divina in her resignation letter. And in fact, he admitted his error when he spoke to or spoke with the company president. So ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled that there was sufficient basis to dismiss Delphine based on uh, serious misconduct and loss of trust and confidence. But the Supreme Court uh, deleted the award of separation pay uh, pursuant to Supreme Court decision stating that separation pay by way of financial assistance may be awarded only if the employee did not is not guilty of moral turpitude. But in this case, uh, the Supreme Court noted that the Delphine committed an immoral act by subjecting his subordinate to sexual harassment. But nevertheless, since the company failed to comply with procedural due process requirements, then uh, Delphine is entitled to indemnity for non-observance of due process. So this shows that uh, we are also required, even if we think that an employee is uh, has committed a, an act which would justify dismissal, it is still important for the employer, uh, especially as HR practitioners or people managers, to observe the procedural due process requirements because we may still expose our uh, company to liability for nominal damages because of non-compliance with procedural due process requirements. So under current uh, jurisprudence, the liability for non-compliance with Supreme uh, with the uh, procedural due process requirements, even if there is a ground to dismiss, is around uh, thirty thousand to fifty thousand pesos. Nevertheless, uh, non-compliance with procedural due process does not invalidate the dismissal of the employee, as long as there is substantial evidence that the employee is guilty of acts or omissions that. Uh, would constitute a just cause for termination of employment. So in this case, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the commission of sexual harassment by Delphine, uh, the manager, was uh, supported by substantial evidence, and this was sufficient to justify uh, Delphine's dismissal. So the next case that I will discuss is the case of Ramon Fernandez, Fernandez versus Duncan Pharmaceuticals Inc. Uh, this is a 2009 uh, decision of the Supreme Court's third division. So this involves a medical representative, uh, Mon Ching, and uh, his subordinate, uh, Cheng. So Mon Ching and Cheng were based in the the Gupan branch of the pharmaceutical company. Uh, after uh, meeting in their office, Mon Ching requested from Cheng certain documents which uh, Cheng left in her house. So Mon Ching suggested that uh, they go to Cheng's house to get the documents, the work-related documents that uh, were needed in the preparation of a report. But upon reaching the house of Cheng, uh, it seems that Mon Ching had, other, uh, had a different agenda aside from, from getting the work-related documents. So Mon, Mon Ching accompanied Cheng to uh, her bedroom to get the documents from her drawer. But uh, while they were looking for uh, the, the documents, Mon Ching suddenly asked uh, Cheng, uh, according to Cheng's letter to or letter complaint to her uh, to, to another manager of the company, uh, Mon Ching supposedly asked uh, or told Cheng, uh, Cheng, uh, na excited yata ako, uh, pwede bang palambing? So that was uh, what Mon Ching told Cheng. So so by the way, before I proceed. Uh, I hope you understand that uh, I will be discussing some sensitive uh, facts which might be 
uh, not be uh, appropriate for for all audiences or all agents uh, ages. So I hope you can also ensure that there are no children present because some of the facts of the case that I discussed might be quite sensitive. So sabi nga, ano tayo, uh, hindi tayo general patronage. Siguro ano tayo dito, uh, rated R or kailangan ng parental guidance, rated PG. So so in the incident that I mentioned, so when 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 Monching told Cheng to that uh, he was a bit excited or kung pwede siya maglambing, Cheng felt a little bit awkward. So he told Monching that he she will go out for a while to buy some refreshments. But when uh, Cheng returned to her room, she was surprised to see Monching already just wearing a only his camiseta. So according to Monching, medyo mainit daw. So that was the excuse provided by by Monching. So nevertheless, uh, they proceeded to discuss the document, the work-related documents, and then uh, Cheng asked Mon Ching to uh, help her in, in preparing the, the work reports. So after uh, Mon Ching was finished uh, providing some tips to, to Cheng on how to make the reports, Cheng decided to, to leave the room to avoid this awkward situation between uh, him and between her and, and Mon Ching. But Mon Ching then suddenly decided to uh, embrace her and then uh, pulled her to the bed and then tried to pin her down. Uh, Mon Ching went on top of Cheng and uh, asked uh, Cheng for a kiss. So Cheng was shocked and told Mon Ching, uh, Mon Ching, uh, ba friends tayo? But according to Mon Ching, I'm not just your friend, I'm also your boss, so you should accede to uh, what I uh, I want at this time. So Mon Ching tried to, uh, again, proceeded to try to uh, pin down Cheng and tried to get in between her legs and tried to kiss her. But Cheng still resisted. And uh, finally, medyo nahimasmasan yata si Mon Ching, uh, he stopped with... Uh, her his advances and then apologized to to Cheng. So Cheng said, "Bakit mo nagawa sa akin to?" And then again, uh, Mon Ching apologized. And then just to get over the incident, just Cheng just told Mon Ching that, "Pag uh, mo nang ulitin to." But uh, about two days later, uh, Mon Ching went back to the house of Cheng, and then uh, when Cheng asked Mon Ching to sit down in, in, in the living room. Uh, Mon Ching asked uh, Cheng, uh, Cheng, maligo ka na, hihintayin kita. And then proceeded to hold the, the thigh of, of, of Cheng. But unknown to Mon Ching, uh, Cheng's boyfriend was also in the house at that time. So when Mon Ching uh, heard some, that there was someone who was uh, going downstairs, uh, Mon Ching was got scared and then left. But there was still a third incident. Uh, a few days later, Mon Ching went back to the apartment of Cheng. Uh, but this time, Cheng did not let him in. So he she just opened the door a little and then uh, told Mon Ching that uh, they should just meet in the, in the office. So Mon Ching got irritated and, and, and left the, uh, the house of Cheng. So afterwards, Cheng filed a, a letter complaint and, and she even executed a sworn statement before the police. Uh, after that, uh, the, the management of the pharmaceutical company proceeded to ask Mon Ching to resign and then forced him to go on leave. Uh, Mon Ching was also replaced by a, a district manager. So because of this, Mon Ching filed a complaint for constructive dismissal before the NLRC. So after learning of the complaint, the company probably realized that uh, it did not comply with the procedural requirements for uh, termination of employment. So it sent several letters directing Mon Ching to report to work, 
and then thereafter issued a notice to explain for the alleged sexual abuse that he committed against Cheng. Uh, thereafter, the company proceeded to dismiss Mon Cheng because he did not uh, report to work anymore. So he was dismissed on the ground of insubordination. So the issue in the complaint filed by Mon Cheng is whether the company was justified in terminating the employment relationship. So according to uh, the labor arbiter, uh, there was just cause for uh, the dismissal of Mon Ching, except that it, the, the company already constructively dismissed him before even initiating disciplinary proceedings. So just like in the case of the, uh, the Villarama case that I discussed earlier, the, the labor arbiter found that there was non-compliance with procedural requirements. So while it upheld the validity of uh, Monching dismissal, it directed the payment of uh, 1,000 pesos as damages. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned uh, earlier, under uh, recent Supreme Court decisions, the penalty for non-compliance with procedural due process is around 30,000 to 50,000 pesos as nominal damages. So the decision of the labor arbiter was affirmed by the NLRC as well as the Court of Appeals, except that the Court of Appeals increased the amount or the award for nominal damages. So what was the ruling of the Supreme Court? Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the employer or the respondent company indeed subjected Monching to constructive dismissal, but nevertheless, the Supreme Court ruled that there was substantial evidence that Monching was guilty of sexual harassment. Now, Monching claimed that uh, the court should not readily believe the allegations of Cheng because there were uh, no other witness to corroborate uh, Weng's statements. So it's, it was a case of uh, Monching having a different version and Cheng having, having a different version of what happened. So it's a case of he said, she said. But according to the Supreme Court, uh, the courts usually give credence to the testimony of a victim uh, because normally no Filipina woman would willingly uh, undergo public humiliation of, uh, of alleging that she has been the, subjected to sexual abuse if the allegations are not true. So this is the so-called Maria Clara or women's honor doctrine. So according to the Supreme Court, uh, kailangan daw paniwalaan yung allegations ng isang Filipina dahil hindi naman magre-reklamo ang isang uh, Filipina kung hindi naman siya talaga uh, naging biktima ng, ng sexual harassment. So, so the court uh, gave credence to the allegations of Cheng. So by, because Mon Ching committed sexual abuse against his subordinate, so this shows that his lack of fitness to continue as a managerial employee. So therefore, his dismissal uh, was uh, upheld by the Supreme Court, except that since there was non-compliance with procedural requirements, then uh, the court also upheld the award of nominal damages in favor of Mon Ching. So this is another example of uh, the, the sexual offender being awarded damages just because the employer uh, uh, took shortcuts in in terminating the employment relationship and not complying with the procedural due process requirements so hindi po po pwede sa atin yung parang nakikita natin sa mga pelikula na pagka nahuli sa akto yung isang employee ay sasabihin na lang na you're fired so kailangan mag-comply pa rin tayo sa procedural due process requirements Kahit natingin natin, meron naman tayong sapat na dahilan para tanggalin sa trabaho yung ating empleyado. So, pero importante po dito sa case ng Formantes, yung sinabi ko nga na uh, Maria Clara or Women's Honor Doctrine. You might have heard uh, earlier this year in, in news reports, I think it was this was also uh, covered by TV Patrol, where in the... the it was reported that the so-called Maria Clara Doctrine was uh, supposedly reversed by the Supreme Court in a 
2018 decision. So this is the case of uh, People versus Amarela, which was rendered or by promulgated by the Supreme Court in January 2018. So the case of People versus Amarela involved a rape case against uh, or rape conviction against uh, two persons on the basis of the testimony of the victim. So according to the, in, in that particular case of Amarela, the Supreme Court acquitted the, the accused because it did not believe the allegations of the alleged rape victim. The court noted that uh, based on the circumstances, the allegations of the alleged rape victim was not credible. And it also mentioned that uh, the, the court should uh, re-examine or review the Maria Clara stereotype of a of the mod as of the Filipina woman, uh, because according to the Supreme Court today, we cannot simply be stuck to the Maria Clara stereotype of a demure and reserved Filipino woman. We should stay away from such mindset and accept the realities of a woman's dynamic role in society. So according to the Supreme Court, the modern Filipino woman is uh, confidently intelligent and beautiful. So parang Pia words back, no? Na confidently beautiful with the heart. So according to the Supreme Court, hindi naman lahat ng Filipina ngayon ay naive or demure or will be reluctant to uh, defend herself against sexual advances or uh, just will readily or truthfully uh, state that she has been the subject of a sexual abuse. So the whole Supreme Court said that uh, the allegations of sexual abuse of har or harassment should still be uh, scrutinized based on the surrounding circumstances. Actually, this is the, the case of people versus Amarela should not be considered as a reversal of the so called Maria Clara doctrine. Uh, for one, it was decided by the third division of the Supreme Court and uh, penned by uh, then Supreme Court Justice Martires, who is now the our ombudsman. Uh, according to the Philippine Constitution, no doctrine or principle laid down by the Supreme Court uh, may be modified or reversed except by the Supreme Court sitting and bank. So, ano ba ba yung ibig sabihin ng unbank? Ibig sabihin nun, the, the Supreme Court, the, all the members of the Supreme Court should deliberate and rule on the matter. But in this particular case of People versus Amarela, the ruling was rendered only by a division of or composed of five Supreme Court justices. So their ruling in the case of People Amarela cannot be considered as a doctrine that will uh, reverse previous decisions on the matter. Uh, but nevertheless, we can uh, also see in the case of Formantes that, uh, allega that, that the court also looked into the circumstances of the case and gave credence to the allegations of, of Cheng uh, based on the circumstances. So hindi tataga reversal, uh, the court will just look into the unique circumstances of the case. I think we are running out of time, so maybe I'll just discuss uh, one one more case, the case of Philippine Ayolos Automotive United Corporation versus NLRC. Nevertheless, I will give a copy of my slides to, to PMAP. And all of you who are interested may uh, ask PMAP for uh, a copy of my slides. So I said earlier, in the case of uh, violations of the anti-sexual harassment law, the prescriptive period for filing civil or criminal cases is uh, three years. And under the, uh, but but uh, in case of disciplinary actions uh, against the employee, the prescriptive period will not apply. Uh, this case of Philippine Ayolos Automotive United Corporation shows that uh, sexual harassment uh, may be an issue not only in a case against the offender, it may also be raised by the victim. And in some instances, the victim might not be subject to prescription if uh, the complaint or the allegation is not raised uh, in a timely manner. So this case involves uh, Rosalinda, who was a company nurse 
and uh, the plant manager, uh, the, uh, William. So Rosalinda claims that at, as early as her first year of employment, William already expressed uh, that he liked her and asked her to uh, for a date. He also subjected her to constant touching of her arms or holding her hands uh, and made sexual advances. But Rosalinda tried to resist uh, William's advances until uh, around four years later, na inip na puya tatong si William. He uh, William threatened Rosalinda that if she will not give in to the sexual advances, then he will retaliate against her. So what happened is that uh, William transferred. Uh, Rosalinda was then loca uh, located. Uh, well, had a, a table in the office with a phone and intercom. What William did was that. Uh, without the knowledge of uh, Rosalinda, he transferred her to a, an isolated location and took away her phone and intercom. So this resulted in an argument. And thereafter, in the heat of anger, Rosalinda threw a stapler at William, the plant manager. So normally, this would be considered as uh, insubordination because uh, William was the plant manager and uh, Rosalinda was his subordinate. But according to Rosalinda, this was the, the throwing of the stapler was merely the, the final straw or the last straw because of the sexual advances that uh, William committed. So the company proceeded to dismiss Rosalinda for insubordination. So Rosalinda filed a complaint for illegal dismissal. So I will proceed immediately to the ruling of the Supreme Court due to lack of time and so that you will have some time to raise some questions. So according to the Supreme Court, even if Rosalinda waited for four years to uh, raise her complaints against uh, William, uh, she was not barred from doing so because it would appear that she just wanted to keep her job. And uh, at the first opportunity to do so, when once she was already dismissed by the company, she, she immediately made the allegations against William. So the court gave credence to the allegations of Rosalinda. Uh, so a court, the, since the court believed that Rosalinda was the subject of uh, sexual harassment by William, the court considered that, that the actions of Rosalinda were mitigated, so there was no sufficient grounds to dismiss her. And uh, therefore, her dismissal being too harsh should be deemed illegal, and she is entitled to separation pay, back wages, and damages. Now, I, I prepared some uh, a number of Supreme Court decisions which also involve immorality and romance in the workplace. But since we're only given, normally my presentation is for two hours, but since we're uh, just given one hour, I will proceed to maybe just discuss some uh, some lessons from uh, the Supreme Court decisions uh, in, in my presentation. So I said earlier, we are in a pro-labor jurisdiction. Uh, but based on the Supreme Court decisions uh, in my presentation, not every labor dispute will be in favor of the workers. And to justify the restriction on the employee's rights, the employer must show, of course, present substantial evidence and show the existence of reasonable business necessity. So in case of dismissal of managers, for instance, it should show that, uh, that uh, it is important, for instance, for managers to be able to respect the right of their subordinates so there might be a reasonable necessity or because of the loss of trust and confidence there is a reasonable necessity to terminate the employment relationship and of course the employer should comply with procedural due process requirement uh, requirements because as uh, cited in the examples the employer may nevertheless be held liable for nominal damages if it failed to it fails to comply with procedural due process requirements even if there are sufficient grounds to dismiss now, how can we prevent sexual harassment in the workplace? Uh, maybe you can just uh, look into the obligations of the employer and the anti-sexual harassment law. So as I discussed earlier, there's an obligation to promulgate rules on sexual harassment. So just to add to that, uh, we HR managers or people managers should create clear anti-harassment policies, which we should develop together with uh, uh, our employees. Uh, the Philippine Constitution in this regard also mentions that the employees have the right to participate in uh, promulgating the promulgation of policies which affect their rights, benefits, and, well and welfare. So what do we usually recommend 
So when we promulgate the anti -sex the sexual harassment policy, we try to circulate a draft, get the employees' comments. Uh, hopefully, they will provide uh, helpful inputs. Of course, the employer is not required to incorporate all these comments or inputs in in, in the final draft, but at least this will show that uh, we consulted the employees. And then after that, after the consultation, we can then proceed to promulgate the, the anti-sexual harassment policy. But our obligation in connection with the anti-sexual harassment policy should not end with the promulgation of the policy. We should continue to monitor and revise the policy to ensure that uh, we will be able to address situations we were, which were, we were not able to address initially. Uh, of course, we should also protect uh, protection to, to witnesses who, or provide protection to witnesses who who might be uh, feel who might feel threatened uh, because normally a complaint for sexual harassment is filed against a manager. So we should ensure that the the, the witnesses are adequately protected in case they they accuse managers of uh, in uh, impropriety or uh, sexual advances. And for the employees. Uh, the, the obligation is, I think, is not just for for the employers. We as employees should also uh, ensure that we do not contribute to creating a culture wherein sexual harassment is tolerated uh, in the workplace. So normally, these are the tips that I, I mentioned: understand, observe, confront, assault, and support. So understand because we need to uh, ensure that our behavior will. Uh, Sometimes we think that, for instance, we're making jokes that uh, our behavior is not inappropriate, but we are already hurting the feelings of, of others. Or sometimes we unknowingly uh, commit harassment because we, we think that the uh, biru natin na green jokes, for instance, okay lang yan kasi uh, parang uh, parte lang ng, ng kultura natin. Pero actually, it's, all, it's already creating a, an intimidating uh, atmosphere so we should all be able to understand of not just uh, the actions of others but our own actions we should also observe and examine and confront if uh, others are committing sexual harassment so sabi nga natin hindi naman nila minsan alam na they are committing sexual harassment so we should confront the offender make them know that what they are doing is uh, is not appropriate or not right and then, uh, if necessary, document the confrontation so that we can have some evidence if uh, if certain proceedings, disciplinary proceedings, would arise. Uh, we should resolve resolve the matter by seeking confidential advice, maybe from our mentors or managers, and document the incident of sexual harassment. And if necessary, uh, initiate disciplinary proceedings against the guilty persons. And lastly, we should support. Uh, those who are making complaints by if we witness uh, incidents of sexual harassment, we should be willing to testify and, of course, protect the witnesses so that uh, we do not develop a culture where sexual harassment is tolerated. So I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, yes, Attorney John. So we already have here a set of questions. So first from Ms. Jocelyn. Um, what can HR do when illicit relationship between co-employers, either one is single or both married, occur and reported to HR? We're aware that there are limits on how HR should act on this kind of complaint. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jocelyn. That is actually a, a usual question by HR managers. Meron po kaming uh, complainant, asawa ng isang employee namin. Nagre-reklamo, yun daw asawa niya, yung husband niya ay merong mistress, tapos gusto niyang patanggal yung asawa niya. O kaya naman, merong uh, complainant, an employee, pupunta sa employer, yung daw employee na babae ay mistress ng asawa niya at gustong patanggal yung babae. So, what can the employer do in case of illicit relationship? As a general rule, uh, an employee may only be dismissed, for instance, for on the ground of serious misconduct or will violation of company policy, as, as, uh, policies against immorality, illicit relations, when the employee's uh, act is work-related. So normally, the illicit relationship should affect the performance of the employee's functions or related to the employee's position. Unfortunately, I was not able to discuss. Uh, meron, meron po dun sa slides ko. Meron dyan yung Alilem case. Uh, 
na and and uh, yung kadis basically uh, according to the Supreme Court uh, the employee may be dismissed if uh, the commission uh, the illicit relationship is uh, related to the employee's position so in the case of in, uh, teachers for instance kung kailang, if the teacher will commit immorality then the employer might be justified in dismissing the teacher because according to the Supreme Court the the supreme the teacher is uh, required to abide by a higher standard kasi siya yung example sa mga estudyante niya she he or she is exercising secondary parental authority to the students so they should be uh, held uh, held to a higher standard of morality but in the case of uh Cadiz, for instance uh, if this is a 2000 uh 16 case no this involves actually an hr officer Ang, ang basic facts nito, yung si Christine Joy, an HR officer, was uh, placed on indefinite preventive suspension by Brent School. Yung Brent School is a religious institution because of uh, pregnancy out of wedlock. So single naman si Christine and single yung boyfriend niya. Pero since nabuntis si Christine, bago sila magpakasal, according to the Supreme Court, uh, uh, sorry, according to the employer, Brent School, the acts committed by Christine scandalized the, the uh, religious institution and therefore it had ground to subject her to preventive suspension because of immorality. But according to the Supreme Court, ano ba yung immorality? Will it be based on the standards of the employer if it is a religious institution? According to the Supreme Court, uh, the, in, in determining whether a person is guilty of immorality or for instance, due to illicit relations, consideration should be based on totality of circumstances and assessment of the circumstances which will be the prevailing norms of conduct. So, in, for instance, yung sabi ko sa teacher, parang pwedeng tanggalin because of illicit relations. In the case of this HR officer, uh, since wala na, pareho naman silang single, uh, sabi ng Supreme Court, wala daw sufficient ground to dismiss because Christine, because, just because she engaged in premarital sex, was not guilty of immorality. So one last example lang po, no? mabilis lang to yung, yung alilem, credit cooperative, this involves a bookkeeper who had an extramarital affair. So the Supreme Court justified the dismissal of the bookkeeper because according to them, uh, there was, was already a complaint filed by members of the cooperative, credit cooperative, who was the employer, uh, because of the extramarital affair of the bookkeeper. So normally, yung extramarital affair, hindi yan ground to dismiss. But in the case of the bookkeeper in the Alilem case, uh, naka-apektohan na yung trabaho niya dahil er, subject na siya ng mga complaints by uh, the members of the credit cooperative. And there was already a threat by the members of the cooperative to uh, withdraw their deposits from uh, the credit cooperative. So parang tapos, being a bookkeeper, he was required to at least uh, uh, expected to show that he would act in an appropriate manner kasi kung, kung involved siya sa scandal uh, baka hindi pagkatiwalaan yung bookkeeping niya ng mga finances ng credit cooperative so nakaka-apekto so work, medyo work-related na rin or related na rin sa position niya yung illicit relationship and it was considered as a sufficient ground to dismiss uh, Mr. Alilem Okay, sir. So another question from Ms. Rosalie. If a full-time employee committed a sexual act against third-party employee, then the latter filed a complaint, will she, will she eventually retract and for the reason that the employee already apologized? Can the company still pursue a disciplinary case against the, its employees? So just to clarify, no, yung uh, sexual offender dito was the employee, while the victim is a non-employee. Kanan po ba yung question? So balik tayo dun sa general rule, na normally, if this does not involve the performance of uh, the work of the employee, then this should not be a ground to dismiss the employee. Pero kung medyo related sa functions, kasi medyo, medyo general yung question, no? kung related sa functions ng employee, baka pwedeng ground for disciplinary action, including dismissal. Okay, sir. So next question is, is sexual harassment considered a criminal case? It's considered a criminal, uh, it can be a ground for a criminal complaint if 
it meets the elements that I discussed earlier under the anti-sexual harassment law. So, sabi ko nga kanina, kailangan merong, uh, it is committed by someone who has authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over another. And there is a request, demand request for sexual favor. So, pwedeng magkaroon ng criminal complaint kung ang gumawa niyan ay manager or supervisor over a subordinate. Pag ang uh, sexual harassment ay ginawa ng isang uh, subordinate against a supervisor or against a manager or someone of the same level, it might not be considered as a criminal offense under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act. But nevertheless, it could still be a ground for disciplinary action for violation of company policies. Okay, sir. So, according to Sir Benjamin Tesoro, what is the effect if the employee intentionally takes advantage of the apparent sexual harassment of her employer for her own gain, such as promotion, increase of benefits, and etc.? Like kasi kung plan, talagang, para kasi yung sabi naman ng ano, dahil pumayag yung employee, dahil nakinabang din siya, no? parang ganyan sinasabi, nag-take advantage yung employee. But uh, as we can see from the provision of the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, sexual harassment is still committed uh, regardless of whether the demand for sexual favor is accepted by the object of the said act. So, basta, as long as there's authority, influence, or moral ascendancy, and there is a demand for sexual favor, for favorable terms or, condition, or conditions of employment, in this case, meron pa ngang promotion, so pasok siya dun sa elements ng Anti-Sexual Harassment Act. So, pwede pa rin siyang maging violation and may, pwede pa rin maging subject of a uh, complaint for sexual harassment. Okay, sir. So, is there a like a timeline for one to report a case like if the employee is afraid to bring it up to the management and took her some time to report will it affect the complaint okay well we should distinguish between criminal and civil cases and disciplinary proceedings for criminal and civil cases there is a prescriptive period so me time me deadline so it should the complaint should be filed within three years from the commission of the act but for uh, administrative cases or disciplinary proceedings, as uh, we discussed in the case of Philippine Ayolos kanina, no? yung company nurse na naghintay pa siya ng apat na taon, wala namang prescriptive period uh, bago ka magreklamo. Kaya lang, syempre, makaka-apekto rin sa credibility nung yung allegations kung masyado nang matagal tapos hindi ka nagre-reklamo. Uh, of course, you can also explain the circumstances why you failed to file a complaint. In the case of the Philippine Ayolos that I mentioned earlier, sabi ng Supreme Court na takot yung empleyado na matanggal sa trabaho. Pero at the first opportunity, when she was uh, uh, already dismissed, she raised her complaint and the court still uh, gave credence to her allegation. Okay. So from Ms. Cecil, for two married employees strongly suspected of having illicit relationship, what sort of evidence is required to have grounds for disciplinary action? Well, balik muna tayo first, no? Bawo muna regardless of the evidence. First of all, yung bang extramarital affair uh, ground ba siya for disciplinary action? So, balik tayo sa general rule na kailangan pakita natin that the affair is uh, work-related or is affect related relevant to the position of the employee or it would affect the employee's performance of uh, his or her duties. So, kung wala yung additional circumstances na yun, the extramarital affair may not necessarily be a ground for disciplinary action. Now, assuming that it is a ground because of the circumstances that I mentioned, uh, the required evidence uh, is substantial evidence. Yung, yung technical meaning or legal meaning yan, such relevant evidence as a uh, reasonable man might uh, find sufficient to justify a conclusion. So, pag ganyan naman kasi, pwede tayong parang common sense na rin ano, kung ano yung mas credible. Tingnan natin yung circumstances kung merong nakaka may personal knowledge ba na nakakikita sila na merong affair talaga uh, na, na merong public display of affection for instance then this could be sufficient to initiate disciplinary proceedings. Hindi naman kailangan beyond reasonable doubt pagka doon tayo sa disciplinary proceedings. Eh. Substantial evidence lang. Okay. So here's our last two questions, sir. So from Miss Julie, what if there's no sexual favor involved? Do we consider giving inappropriate compliment as texting mo naman or 
um, gina-judge niyo yung, uh, yung physical mo na may mali siya, uh, what are the other types or forms of sexual harassment? Okay, thank you for the question. I think that's a good question. No? Hindi siya, kung walang demand or request for sexual favor, it will not be considered as a violation of the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act. But nevertheless, it may still be considered as serious misconduct or maybe violation of certain company policies against harassment, which might lead to disciplinary action. So, hindi, hindi necessarily uh, walang, dahil walang uh, basis for a criminal or civil case, dahil walang demand for sexual favor, uh, hindi, hindi ibig sabihin nun wala nang ground for disciplinary action. Pwede pa rin maging ground for disciplinary action. Yan. Okay. So kahit uh, maging habit na nung other employee yung uh, yung pag cut calling niya, it's, it's still not considered as sexual harassment? It might not be considered as sexual harassment strictly under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, but it might still be considered as serious misconduct or violation of company policies. Okay. Kaya, kaya sabi ko rin kanina, additional tip, kailangan i-confront natin, at least baka hindi aware yung, ano, yung uh, offender na nakakasakit na siya or nakaka-offend na siya, mas maganda i-confront din natin. Then of course, mas maganda yung employer mismo, meron silang uh, clear policies against those kinds of actions. Okay, so down to our last question, sir. Does the law state that sexual harassment is only applicable to women or can it go other way? Was there an instance where the male was sexually harassed? Yes, there is no distinction. So it doesn't matter if the offender is, uh, is male or female or if the victim is male or female. Ang requirement naman po under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act is that the offender has authority, influence, or moral ascendancy. So siya yung manager, supervisor, or mas nakakataas yung position niya, and the victim is a subordinate. So whether or not, the off kahit ano yung gender nila, pwede pa rin makumit yung sexual harassment if there's a demand for sexual favor. Okay, so thank you, Attorney John, for that thorough discussion of sexual harassment in the workplace and for um, entertaining the questions of our dear viewers. Thank you, Attorney John. You're welcome and thank okay. you too. Uh, to all viewers, please don't forget to like our Facebook page, PMAP 1956, and uh, don't forget to log into our website, www.pmap.org.ph. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you.